This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We've been having a lot of fun this month having special guests on to discuss something that's trending in true crime. This time, we're talking about a newly released documentary that tells the heartbreaking story of a missing young woman. But this one is unique in that Vanessa Guillen was a United States Army soldier who went missing from a Texas military base. Her family would face an uphill battle trying to get answers when Vanessa's superiors closed ranks and did little to investigate her disappearance at the beginning. But the efforts of her family through protests and social media posts that went viral sparked a movement that shone a spotlight on abuses that had up to that point gone unchecked against female military members. Um, This new Netflix documentary is titled I Am Vanessa Guillen and was recently released. And I'm so thrilled to be able to discuss it with Margo, host of the podcast Military Murder. I mean, the perfect person, right? So Military Murder (laughs) is a true crime podcast that covers cases where the victims and or the perpetrators are members of the military. Uh, Margot herself has served in the military, so I'm really excited to get her insights into this case and this documentary. So welcome, Margot. Hey, Esther. Thank you so much for inviting me on the show. I'm a longtime listener. So I was totally obsessed and fangirling when you contacted me and said you wanted me on the show. I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> it's so weird because I remember, I think I saw you, maybe it was at one of the Crime Cons first. Of, I don't remember where I first met, probably Crime Con. And I think you yeah. said that. You said something about, oh, yeah, you know, way early on when I started, I reached out to you and and you you responded and I was so, you know, uh, happy that you did that. And I was, you know, cause I was new and I'm like, I did. <laughs> I, <laughs> yep, yep. I, you guys, you, I can't remember nothing. You know what I mean? Like until, until I see a face, like it means like, it means nothing. You get emails, you get DMS, you get, you know, whatever. But until I see a face and I'm like, Oh my God, that's you. And then, you know, and then, so when I see you, I'm like that, I'm like, Oh my God, it's Margo. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I really, I, I, I feel you 100% now because I get so many emails and, and messages on through social media that I am I have a hard time even figuring it out. So I completely understand. But yeah, you were one of the first people that I reached out to before I even started the podcast. And I was like, hey, like, I'm trying to get into the true crime space, but I want to niche down. And you, and you, I remember you saying like, that's a really good idea because the true crime space is so oversaturated. And um, it was, it's really sometimes, you know, I get a little bit frustrated. I'm like, you know what, I'm going to quit military true crime. I'm just going to do regular true crime. Um, but I mean, it really has become like my passion. And so, I mean, it was my passion from the beginning, um, but it's, it's even, it's even more now, especially because of all the developing cases. Yeah. And you know, that, so let's talk a little bit about military murder, because one of the things that I didn't realize, and I bet you a lot of my, my listeners didn't realize this either. So when we're talking about, you know, we think about, okay, military murder stuff that happened like this, this, is what we're going to talk about the Vanessa, Vanessa Gia, And it's so, it's so enmeshed in, you know, the military and everything like that. So sometimes people, I think maybe if they see the name of your podcast might think, oh, okay, well, it's stuff that happens, you know, it's like, it's military, it's all about the military or whatever. And it's not. Because one of the things that I didn't realize as I started listening to your episodes was that there's so many of these really famous cases that these people were military or or ex-military, you know, like, I didn't, I had no, I mean, I get, I I must have known because I read books about it and about the case and about the person and all this stuff. But like um, Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, BTK, these guys were in the military and I totally forgot that or Mm -hmm. it just wasn't, you know, usually they don't say about if that's part of the story. So I guess your, your podcast can be, yeah, it's about military murder, but it's about so much more anyway, right? So is that make it a little easier to say, oh, I can keep doing this podcast and keep finding, you know, uh, cases that I'm interested in covering? Oh, yes. I mean, I, I the first thing that got me interested in it was when I was watching true crime documentaries because I've, I'm a long time true crime buff, you know, but I noticed as I was listening to like serial killer documentaries or watching them, excuse me, that I was like, wait a minute, that person served in the military. Wait a minute, that person served in the military. And so 
one of the things that that caught my attention was that, especially as a, as a veteran myself, and at the time I was active duty, and I was working at the legal office as a JAG, was that we 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 place so much more trust when the when a, when you use the title veteran or military member it's almost like you there's a there's a guard that we all kind of hold up right especially when you watch true crime or you listen to true crime podcasts you're always like on guard but when someone says oh i'm a veteran or oh i served this many years or i'm a, i retired from the air force or whatever it's almost like you're like oh this is a safe person like it's almost like an automatic feeling um and so listening to and, and watching the true crime docs and especially about the serial killers but then also working in the legal office it occurred to me that it that that label necessarily doesn't make you a better person yes our veterans i have so much respect for veterans and people who serve but a lot of people who have bad intentions can hide behind that kind of mask or that kind of protection and it's clear as day when you when you're watching some of these cases and the i am vanessa guillen is a perfect example where sometimes we're so enthralled in the military community when you're in it that you cannot fathom that somebody carrying a tough box um, and in the middle of the night, like out of a building where a girl has been missing, you, you don't fathom like, oh, maybe that guy who's carrying that tough box has something to do with this girl's disappearance because it's just so hard to comprehend that that would even be possible. You know what I mean? Right, right. Exactly. But Let's go ahead and we're going to get into it right now. But also I want to say joining us for this discussion once more is my wonderful right-hand chica, Lorena. How are you doing today, Lorena? Good, good, Margo. So excited that you're here. That was a wonderful intro that you just knocked out of the park. (laughs) Oh, thank you. This is going to be easy for us, right, Lorena? It's going to be really easy for us. (laughs) I'm like, I don't even got to say anything. (laughs) We'll let let Margo do all the heavy heavy lifting on this one, right? (laughs) Yeah. This is actually a military murder episode. (laughs) <laughs> featuring one's want a crime really <laughs> so i'm gonna no, do, i'm just gonna do a, i'm just gonna do a, a summary of the case margo has covered this case extensively on, on military murder so we're going to you know get into some of the details but i'm sure she's gonna have more to add that we don't know um because you know she's done much more research on it than than i have i did follow it like a lot of people did when it happened um, uh, but I know that you have been following up on your podcast with updates and things as well. So, um, so we'll have all that too. Okay. So just, just to do, like I said, a very brief summary before we get into the details is again, the, the documentary is called, um, I am Vanessa Guillen and, and it came out on Netflix just in November. So Vanessa Guillen knew she wanted to join the military since she was 10 years old. She joined the army soon after graduating high school and began her career, pretty soon after that at Fort Hood Army Base in Killeen, Texas. But soon after being stationed at Fort Hood, Vanessa began to hint to family and friends that, quote, not all was as it seemed in the military and specifically at Fort Hood. Uh, Vanessa went missing from Fort Hood on April 22, 2020, and it would take two months before her family learned that she had been murdered by another soldier and her body buried under concrete along a riverbed. The documentary, I Am Vanessa Guillen, details the case and the aftermath. So that's that's the the short the short summary. And um, there are, you know, as we get to some of the, the players that we see in the documentary, we'll, you know, explain who they are and and that kind of thing. I, I'll, I guess I'll let you learn. Do you want to just kind of say who Vanessa Guillen was? Just, you know, the, the, the short um, kind of bio of her. Sure. Yeah. Um, so Vanessa Guillen, um, she was a 20 year old soldier in the army. Um, she was born into a very traditional Hispanic Mexican household. Um, she was one of six children. She attended uh, Cesar E. Chavez High School and she graduated in 2018. She was top 15 in her class. She was an awesome soccer player, um, a great high school student. She had tons of friends and she even had a fiance. Um, her one of her younger sisters considered her to be not necessarily like a sister figure, but a mom figure. You know, she was education was very important to her. Um, getting her homework done um, was super important to her. So she was a pretty straight edged gal, if I would say so. Um, and so, yeah, seeing that she wanted to be in the military at the age of 10 makes sense. You know, maybe that structure. I was going to say, one of the things that struck me about the documentary and also just about her story, it's very similar to a lot of stories uh, about people joining the military, is 
she had told her mom she wanted to join and her mom was like no you're not and then she basically did on her own you know she did she enlisted and then she told her mom well I'm sorry I already did it and that storyline is very familiar to me because I've heard it so many times and one not only the stories that I tell in on military murder podcast but also just with a lot of people that I know in the military where especially uh, ladies women um, they tend to kind of um, hint at that they're going to join the military but when their family says no they just go and kind of secretly do it because once you're signed up you know you can't back down so I thought that that was very interesting and and basically her mom was like well I guess she's going yeah well yeah especially in you know a Mexican family one girls do not join the military um and it's like no like pretty much baquet for what like wh- like why are you going to join when you have you know a family here that you could like you know care for and take care of here um mm-hmm. this whole documentary and story really resonated with me coming from a I'm sure all three of us coming from a Hispanic Latin background and just seeing um, the mom and the family just so emotional. That's what like really got to me um, while watching this. So, yeah, yeah, yeah I guess I guess we didn't favorite. mention that, but uh, I guess we could we could say what, what our backgrounds are. So <laughs> I'm Mexican-American. My my parents were born here. Uh, I think all but one of my grandparents was were also born here, but they also were very traditional Mexican family, Catholic spoke Spanish and English in the home. It was my great grandparents who were the first ones to to migrate here to the US. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was some of them that were here before it was the US <laughs> before it was the US when it was still Mexico, you know, here in California. So um so yeah, so we we've been Californians for a long time. <laughs> awesome. So but yeah, so that's that's mine. And Lorena. Um so I'm like one and a half first generation. Uh, my dad was born in Mexico and my mom was born in California, but both very traditional Catholic Hispanics. Um, I Spanish was my first language. I didn't learn English pretty much until kindergarten. Once I was going to school, I had to learn. And yeah, you know, raised very traditionally. I couldn't paint my fingernails till the day of my quinceanera when I was 15 years old. <laughs> you know, why wear makeup to attract boys? <laughs> Just very, <laughs> especially being a girl in a very traditional Hispanic household was definitely not the easiest. Um, my parents have definitely lightened up quite a bit, but uh, yeah, very, very traditional. So so my background is I'm I was born here in the U.S. I'm half Puerto Rican and half Colombian. So my dad um, migrated to the U.S. from Colombia when he was 12. And then my mom was born here, but my grandmother was born in Puerto Rico. And my mom and my parents had me when they were very young. And so I was raised with my grandmother mostly. Um, my mom and my dad were basically like my siblings <laughs> at that point. Wow. Uh, but I also just like you, Lorena, I spoke Spanish strictly until I was forced uh, at five years old or four years old. Um, going into pre-K and kindergarten to speak English. And and everyone kind of laughs about it now because they're like, do you understand that you, the only word you knew in English was hot dog? And so <laughs> whenever I went anywhere, I basically just cried hot dog. And so everyone's serving me these hot dogs, but that's all I knew how to say. <laughs> Um, so I think it's funny. Um, it's it's kind of unfortunate. I feel like I'm failing as a parent because I have three little daughters and um, I haven't taught I haven't taught them how to speak in the, uh, Spanish, excuse me. And um, I feel like I'm really failing and I keep trying I'm like, OK, I'm going to do it one day. You know, I, I talk to them occasionally in Spanish, but because all they do is talking in, in English and, and their father only speaks English. It's just so difficult, you know, and I know my parents are like, well, you need to start, you know, that you're, you're mm-hmm. at a disadvantage to not teach your children. And, and I know it. I know it. But yeah. Well, it's so wild now, especially especially in the Bay Area where um, well, all throughout California, I don't know if there's um, elementary schools like this in Texas, but there's like Spanish English yeah. immersion schools yeah. and starting in kindergarten. And so now, you know, when I was at that age, you know, they're like, she's going to fall behind because she doesn't know English. And now it's like they're going to fall behind if they don't know a second language. So yeah. Yeah. it's so crazy how the times have changed. Um, well, I had the, I had the opposite. Those- I had the, the opposite because my parents were born here, but they spoke both Spanish and English um, in the home. Mm-hmm. Well, to the parents only Spanish, right? And then, but they spoke English because they were born here. Um, but when they went to school, they went to Catholic school in a small town in, down in, uh, you know, the, the Central Valley. And there was nuns there and you were not allowed to speak Spanish. You were, if you spoke Spanish, you would get hit with the ruler <clears throat> on hands. What? Yeah, you could not speak Spanish. Um, and I don't know. They just didn't like it. So my parents learned to only speak English around people who were English spe- speakers, right? Um, and then when they had us, me and my brother, they 
they taught us English. They did not teach us Spanish because they were afraid that we would be ostracized or we would be um, somehow punished in school. So we wow. didn't learn it. That's the re- and there was a lot of there's there's a lot of uh, kids that were the same thing um, again, kind of from the similar background where the parents were either born here or had come here while they were still in school or something like that. Um, that that happened. So I only learned. Spanish, and I am not fluent in any way, shape, or form, but I can understand, you know, it pretty well, and I can speak it, especially when I go to Mexico. It's like it comes back, you know, because mm-hmm. I've heard it all my life. And then my first husband was a Mexican national who spoke almost exclusively in Spanish, so that's when I learned mm-hmm. it. Um, so, you know, because I was around him and his family, and they all spoke Spanish. And so when, you, when you're around it a lot, it's a lot easier when you're not, mm-hmm. it's it's harder to uh, to remember and, like you said, teach your kids and and all of that. My kids mm-hmm. had to learn on their own. <laughs> they to, they're gonna learn. They gotta learn on their own because I can't. I'm not gonna teach you well enough. So, uh, yeah. But you know, wh- when my kids are around family members who speak Spanish, they can understand. You know, it's weird. It's it's a weird kind of fluency where you understand. You know, I can watch you know telenovelas and everything, but I can't like speak fluently in Spanish. So, and I, I, it is, it feels, it feels sad to me that I can't do that, but yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. it, it's so interesting to see all the different, how all the different dynamics of it all. Right. And yeah. depending on where you grow up and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I think, you know, no, no matter what, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of pride, you know, in, in, you know, who you are, but also family. And I see this in this documentary, you know, like, how how mm-hmm. how strong they were and how close knit the family was and I think that's what really hit us really hard in this to see and I don't know if that was part of um, what was you know shown or what you learned uh, uh, Margot when you were doing you know researching the case first because we know documentaries are always going to come at it from a certain mm-hmm. angle right so that's kind of what what we look at and that's the thing I, I wanted to talk about too is just overall the documentary itself um one of the things that i noticed is that um they did it was mostly centered on her family it was mostly centered on the the investigation of the disappearance and then kind of like what the family was fighting for as far as justice um and changes in the military afterwards didn't go a lot into Mm -hmm. uh the murder like what led up to it or any of that it didn't go into that and so I, I was yep. thinking about that. I was thinking about you when, when I was like, oh, but there's a lot more here that we didn't really talk about. Um, but just to set the stage, where she was stationed was Fort Hood um, in Killeen, Texas. And it, this is, uh, it was called The Great Place, but it had a terrible reputation. First of all, it's huge. It's huge. It's a huge military base. I think it's like they said, the second largest um, military base. Um, it has the highest sexual assault rate of any base in, in the American military. And it has other, you know, a lot of, lot of uh, violent things and crimes that have happened there that have been very high profile. There were two mass shootings, one in 2009. That was when uh, Major Nadal uh, Hassan killed 13 people and wounded 32 others. He was also a psychiatrist, you know, a psych- mm-hmm. which is, to me was mind-blowing. In 2014, mm-hmm. uh, Ivan uh, Lopez, uh, he was an Iraq War vet, uh, also did a spree killing on Fort Hood. He killed three and wounded 14 others before killing himself. There was also a big scandal, a big prostitution ring, where it was discovered that Sergeant First Class Gregory McQueen was running that, that um, prostitution uh, organization, and he was dishonorably discharged in 2015. And also the prostitution ring was using fellow soldiers were part of this um, Here's the thing that blew my mind about this, and I don't know a whole lot about this case, but I found this detail. He had also been a sexual assault prevention officer mm-hmm. in the military what? on the base. Wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, holy oh, yeah, crap. He was definitely a predator. What he was doing was, because um, I, I think, I'm not sure if I did a TikTok on that one. I think I may have. Um, but what he was doing was, because of his, you know, high rank, he was finding all the single soldiers, like uh, lady soldiers, women soldiers, who basically needed to make extra money and he was pimping them out. 
he was basically saying like, oh, hey, you know, you can make a, you know, you can make a few hundred dollars here. You can make a few hundred dollars there. And that's what he was doing. And because of his position, he knew all the people who may be more vulnerable, vulnerable. and who needed more money or whatever. And that's what he did. And so he he was he was truly a predator. Wow. wow. That's crazy. In 2015, this was so recent. <laughs> like right. not even back in the 80s or 90s. 2015, right. geez. I don't think he got a lot of time in jail. So he might he might actually be out now, I I, I think. Yeah, because wow. I, I just all I saw was he was dishonorably <laughs> discharged. So I didn't even know what his, you know, what if he got jail time or whatever. But geez. Um, yeah. And then, the, of course, the thing we're talking about here, at least where it starts in. And, and this is has been an ongoing issue in this military base is is soldiers that go missing or, you know, die by some mysterious circumstances or something. Thirty nine. Thirty nine soldiers died or went missing from Fort Hood in 2020 alone. Thirty nine. Mm hmm. I mean, that's uh -huh. like, can you imagine if that was a town and 39 people, it's like, mm -hmm. what the hell's going on here? You would think there would be like all kinds of investigations and the FBI, would, every, everything would happen, right? But this is a military base. And, you know, one of the things that we'll, we'll learn is that it's their own kind of ecosystem and it's hard to get any kind of eyes on that or, or, or anything, you know, at least as far as the public, the, the civilians are involved, right? Like uh, Lorena said, she joined the army in 2018 and completed boot camp at Fort Jackson. And she loved it. She loved being in the military. When she first started, she was just, you know, really into this is what she always wanted to do. She loved it. She was thriving there. She was doing great. She was a very disciplined person, like we talked about. And the thing that I liked about what they showed about her is that she's this very disciplined person. She was this very studious girl. Like she was just, you know, she was on it, man. She was just like killing it. But she was also such a, just, she was a girly girl too. You know what I mean? And sometimes we, when we think of military women, we think, oh, they're more, you know, this or that or whatever. It's like, no, they're all kinds of, of people just like in, in, you know, in, in any, anything. Um, and she was just, she loved to dress up and she loved makeup and she loved to, you know, glam it up and she looked beautiful. And, you know, she had a, a boyfriend that she loved and it was, was getting engaged and all that kind of stuff. And yet she was, she was a fierce, you know, chick too. You know what I mean? She, she could really, you know, she, I, I'm sure she gave a lot of the, the guys there a run for their money when she was, cause she was just so disciplined. Right. Um, but then she yeah. was, ba she was, um, uh, where is Fort Jackson is, I forgot to write that. Where is, do you know, does anybody know where Fort Fort Jackson is? I know it's further away. Missouri, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I think, think it's, or maybe not. I could be wrong. I think it's <laughs> Illinois, <laughs> where, something. Florida? I don't know. <laughs> we're, all, we're all guessing. <laughs> Let's just throw, <laughs> throw a dart at the map. map. Okay, it's there. <laughs> I have no idea. Fort Jackson. Fort Jackson. Uh, Columbia, or South Carolina. Columbia, South Carolina. South Carolina. Oh, okay, South Carolina. So yeah, so she was pretty far away. I mean, she had not been, I mean, like you said, she came from this very, uh, you know, this community, the close knit family, and she lived in Houston, Texas. Um, so she, uh, she, when she was stationed at Fort Hood, was what throughout three hours north of of where you know her her family lived. So they were all happy about that. She's going to be close by, right? Um, and her job title was a uh, firearms repair weapons mechanic, I believe. Um, when she's mm -hmm. when she's that's what she was doing. Um, but once she got there, then things started to change as far as how she was, uh, you know, perceiving it and things that she started to say. So I know you know m about that, Margot. What did you kind of gather from that when she, you know, once she was at Fort Hood? Like, what were things were coming out as far as what she was talking about? Well, I think the the main thing is a lot of people have a fairy tale idea of what the military is going to be like. And when it's so go, 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 when you're in boot camp and you're doing all your initial training, you have this expectation that that's what it's going to be like every day. And I think what happened is when she got to Fort Hood, um, she realized that it wasn't, you know, quite as go, go, go as she had anticipated it to be. And then also because she was coming up the ranks, you know, she had only served, what, like a year and a half before everything went down. Um, I guess she realized that now she's going to be around more senior people. But then also because she is, a, you know, a beautiful woman in the military, that aspect of it started to, I think, kind of creep in, you know, where men are making unwanted passes at her and she's kind of having to dodge them everywhere she goes. Um, and she didn't really share a whole lot of that with anybody. And I think that that's one of 
I wouldn't say the biggest problem, but initially um, she had only shared a few things with her mom, I think it was, um, that she had said like, mommy, eso, eso lo que me está pasando, this is what's happening, um, you know, I'm being sexually harassed. Um, but she didn't, she didn't really give names. She didn't really give a whole lot of information. So sometimes I think her mom was probably just thinking like, okay, well, you know, you kind of, she doesn't say it, but I I can imagine because I can imagine what my mom would say. Well, like you have to tough it out. Like you either have to report it or you just need to like ignore it. You know what I mean? And so in her case, there wasn't a lot of documented information about what she was experiencing. But a lot of her Twitter, her Twitter, her tweets and, and just things that she was posting showed like, you know, you know, she would post things like, you know, things aren't always what they seem. It's going to come from the least suspected person. And, and, you know, in retrospect, once she went missing and you're looking at everything back and you're like, what was she talking about? Because even me, when I initially did her the first episode on her, which was when she was still missing, because I did it like a month after she went missing, uh, you know, I was trying to like decipher what she meant. And I don't know her personally, right? I don't know what she was experiencing. Um, but it was a lot like, like, uh, it all went kind of like downhill. It started getting dark as far as like, you know, things aren't always what they seem, yada, yada. So I think she started to experience some things and realize that, you know, it's, she's going to have to make a lot more rank before she can actually make independent decisions for herself. And she was starting to think like, oh my gosh, did I make a huge mistake? That's what, that's what I gathered from my research. So at what point did she open up to, I think it was to her mother that she told something about sexual assault that took place there or sexual harassment that was happening to her or maybe other people? Did that come later or... Well, she had originally told her mom that sexual harassment and sexual assault happened, that she had seen it happen. But her mom asked her, like, is this happening to you at first? And she's like, no, mom, like, te lo juro, like, I swear it's not happening. And then later on, she came back and was just like, I am being harassed by an, a higher up s sergeant. And she was like, what? You told me you weren't. She's like, I know, but I, I didn't know how to tell you. And that's when she was like, all right, like you're either report it or, you know, stick it out. Like, what are you going to do about it? And like Margo mentioned, yeah, just like that whole like tough mentality, like suck it up or do something about it. And so I have my own theories about like what possibly happened um, that day on April 22nd. And we'll get to that. But um, I think she maybe was finally doing something about it. And unfortunately, because of that, it cost her life. There was um, one incident that the mom, I'm not, I, I believe it was the mom recalled, and it was when they were out in a field exercise. It would have been before Christmas time when they were doing an, a field exercise. And then the women or, you know, everybody was supposed to go into the woods and kind of give themselves like a, a, a shower, but with like wipes, like a wipe, a wipe bath. And I guess she was out there and that's when she was supposed to be by herself, but the sergeant like surprised her or walked in on her. And she was kind of like, what the hell, you know? And so that was the only incident that I've heard, that I have personally heard of that um that the mom said that she heard about so that but according to everything the person who walked in on her was not the person who ultimately we all believe killed her Wondery creator of shows like Dr. Death, Scamfluencers and Over My Dead Body now goes even deeper into complex true crime stories to give you an inside look at the facts. Wondery is launching the ultimate true crime fan destination, Exhibit C. It's truly criminal. Dive deep into the most devious scams, manipulative cults, and the coldest of cases. Wondery's Exhibit C lets you view all the evidence through a detective's lens, taking you step by step through the twists and turns of each true crime case. Join the Exhibit C online community to access exclusive show merchandise, member-only content, and to hear directly from top criminal and social justice experts, witnesses, and investigators as they take us beyond the evidence and into the case file. Interact with the Exhibit C community on Facebook to get the latest updates on all the cases you're currently following, hear from true crime experts, and test your true crime knowledge and skills with interactive quizzes. Find even more great true crime podcasts to add to your playlist at the Exhibit C Facebook page. Join now by following Wondery Exhibit C on Facebook or find it on the web at WonderyExhibitC.com. Listen to true crime podcasts on Wondery and Amazon Music. Exhibit C, it's truly criminal. So let's talk about that day, you know, and they, they kind of take it um, 
a little bit step by step in the documentary about what happened. It kind of it kind of just jumps and then it goes to that, but they do talk about the timeline of what happened that day, what they know anyway. Um, this was on Wednesday, April twenty second, twenty twenty. It's so weird to me. It's so that was not so long ago, you know. She texted her fiance in the morning and said she was going into, you know, the base to go to work. Um, and then she was supposed to go hiking with someone. Uh, and so she texted her about something, you know, weather conditions for that day or whatever. But that was the last, I believe that was the last communication anybody got from her. Um, and then, of course, she was seen at Fort Hood. Um, that's where she was working. And until they show two fellow soldiers, uh, these are friends of hers, they find her wallet with her driver's license and her car keys, I believe. So, again, one of the things we see is that the family, of course, is very involved and they they don't hear from her or something happens that there's there's not communication and they start to worry right away. And they start to call and say, hey, you know, where is she? We haven't heard from her. And they're very they're very surprised that. Nobody there seems to know. I mean, like you, ha you're in the military. You have people <laughs> watching you. You think you have people monitoring you all the time, yeah. but you know. So how do you not know where they are? And that was the first thing where that her sisters were getting very frustrated because they they couldn't understand it. So is that is that reality, Margot, or is, or were they thinking something <laughs> different there? No. So let let me explain. So the documentary does kind of just kind of briefly brisk over what happened. So can, if it's, is it okay? Can yeah, I tell you what? Sure. Yeah. actually happened that day and, and why a lot of it is strange. Uh, now, I was not ever in the Army, so I don't know, but it, it's still very strange. So what happens is she goes into work that morning, and remember, this is April 22nd, and we're coming, and, and we're still in, in the height of COVID. So according to the documentary, they weren't actually going into work every single day like normal. The, um, and that particular day, she was called in to do something. We never told who called her in or what it was that she was supposed to do. So she comes in. Also, it's unclear to me if she was in uniform when she showed up that day because no one has ever said was she in uniform or was she not the whole point is that she shows up to work and she gets a text message from Aaron Robinson saying that she needs to come Aaron Robinson is the guy who we suspect killed her um uh when Aaron Robinson sent her a text message she's like hey you need to come do this inventory or something about a weapon because you know she's she's she she works in one arms room and he works in a different arms room or an armory so um he tells her to come over over text message. So she does, she either brings the paper or whatever it is that she does. She leaves behind, like you said, her her identification card. Now, an ID card is life in the military. Mm -hmm. Like we're talking about your military uh, access card. You normally bring that with you everywhere unless you know you're going to come back because you cannot leave the installation without it because if you leave the base, then you have to go in and you need to get signed in and it's really just such a pain in the butt that you'd rather never leave it behind. So she ends up leaving it, which is not totally uncommon, but it, when you leave your ID card, it's almost a sign to the entire world that you're going to come back within five minutes. So she leaves her ID card, she leaves her wallet, and she leaves her... Um, her car keys. The only thing she takes with her is her cell phone. This is in the morning, like around between 10 and 11. She never comes back, never comes back. And like, she was in the office with somebody and and, and they're just kind of like, oh, well, I guess she never came back, which is the first big red sign. Cause I would be like, where the hell did this person go? If they said they were gonna come back, they would come back. So eventually, I, it, it seems to me like the person doesn't re, uh, report her missing. Whoever she was working with, they just lock down for the day and like leave her stuff there. That particular day, um, because of COVID, because of COVID, everything's going on, you're supposed to do like a phone call to all the people that work underneath you. And you're supposed to get like a verbal like, hey, I'm fine. I'm good. Well, her, whoever was in charge of her. I guess they tried to call her. They tried to send her a message. And even though she never responded, they wrongfully Put that she had responded so they accounted for her even though she was unaccounted for oh wow. wow so there's a lot of things that are going on here that are very strange now um i don't remember what your first question oh, i don't remember what your question specifically was but is it normal the answer is no but we were also living in an abnormal mm -hmm. environment right because this is six weeks or actually yeah it's about five weeks into covid restrictions i don't specifically know what was going on at fort hood at the time because every military installation did it differently but i know for myself we were all teleworking and um because we used to talk over over email and either 
uh, you know, video every time we weren't doing accountability like that, but I don't know how they were doing accountability at Fort Hood, especially for their lower ranking um, enlisted members. So that's just a little background there. Right. No, that, that makes, that that makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had no idea about any of that. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. So, and, and they did question Aaron Robinson. They did question him, but it was very, it seemed to be very brief. Like he just said. It was over the phone. Yeah. It was over the phone. So imagine this, because you do true, you've been doing true crime forever. Imagine someone goes missing and the last person who ever sees that, the the victim or the, the person who's missing, you call them up and you're like, hey, did you see this person? Oh, yeah. Okay. And you don't even take notes like you're you're taking like like two, two, you know, two word sentences. You're not even writing everything they say down. You're not recording it. You're not bringing them in. And that's exactly what they did with Aaron Robinson. Now, we discovered this giant indiscretion um, months later after Vanessa had been found when they did the Fort Hood report, um, internal report. That's when we you know, they release it to the public that that's what they did. Because for a whole, the whole time you're thinking, if he was the last person who saw her, wouldn't they have either one brought him in for questioning, like into the office, or two, wouldn't they have at least gone to the place where she was last known to be, which was in his, in this arms room. Mm-hmm. But that, inf- that didn't happen because they were doing everything over the phone. It, wow. That was my question too, because what we, what we discover, you know, later on, of course, and people people know this case or whatever that she she was found and she had been murdered did it happen there did it happen there like because like you said if they hadn't gone there then how would they even like know it was a crime scene right how would after so so long after the fact so do we even know where it happened i don't know that the sad part is i um uh 100 percent will never know because that part of the investigation has not been released. And now that Cecily has pled guilty, I don't think we're ever going to find information about that out. But but the story is that we eventually learn is that she was murdered. So once she left, she, she was murdered almost right away. So she left her arms room and she went to Aaron Robinson's arms room and something happened there, some sort of altercation where he hid her over the head and then killed her. Which which is interesting to me because I'm like, when you hit someone over the head, there is so much blood, especially when you bludgeon someone. There is so much blood. And if you've ever been into an arms room or any office in the military, there are so many nooks and crannies and crevices that there is no way that anybody could have cleaned that up well enough to not discover it. And wow. so that's what I have a hard time believing. But the story is that she was bludgeoned and murdered in that room and then in the other room with, where Aaron Robinson was and then placed in a tough box, which is one of these huge boxes where you just put all types of equipment in. And he, it's big enough to fit a body. So he placed her in that in there and then waited until dark to come back to the office to roll her out. So the question is, if she did bleed out, if she did bleed out in the in the arms room or even if when once he placed her in the tough box and there was blood. Blood, there's no way that there, that 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 tough box didn't have holes on the bottom where you're rolling it out and there's like maybe blood blood lit, blood spots coming out. Like I just I just can't even imagine that this would happen because you have to remember from the day that she went missing to the day that she was found. I actually counted it the other day. It was ten weeks, okay. ten weeks. Yeah. So it could have been any time when they, you know, I don't know if they figured out how long the body had been out there or whatever. But yeah, there's it's crazy. Yeah, definitely there had to be evidence there. That's why when you said they just talked to him on the phone, they didn't even go to where he was working. Of course, mm-hmm. there probably was, you know, scads of evidence if it happened there. But of course, mm-hmm. we like you said, we will never know because they didn't do that, which is so crazy. So crazy. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing where you see her family members, uh, especially her sister Myra, who's a big part of the story on the documentary, so frustrated because she's like they're not saying anything they're not giving us any any answers they're not saying anything um and she didn't know what that was but you know one of the things i got to say like you said earlier about there's this perception of of military people being a certain type of way or 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 being respected or whatever and i feel Mm -hmm. like a lot of it for most people if they went into a military you know, they put on uniform and they got all these you know protocols and all this stuff and you're going in there and you're saying hey we don't have we need information you know can you tell us whatever and they're just kind of like giving you very short shrift on it and and just kind of acting very official or whatever they're doing to, to not you know 
share anything. Oh, that's classified. I don't know what, what the words they use, mm-hmm. but it sounds like that kind of thing that most people would be intimidated that they would just be mm-hmm. like, because you're thinking, oh, well, they're, they're official. So, you know, they're in a uniform and I can't question them because it's intimidating. Right. And so, especially if, you know, if they're, they're, you know, the commander or whoever is there with all of the you know, they just Start have all the, yeah, they have all this, on. we as civilians, it's like, that is foreign to us and it's very intimidating and it's like, I don't, you know, gosh, you know, like we can't question this or whatever. Um, but her family didn't, didn't back down, you know, which is amazing to me. And so that's the thing I think that the documentary was really picking up on was the fact that how they really pushed for answers because they were just like, desperate to find Vanessa. They were just desperate to find Vanessa. And even when it got past the point where they're thinking, you know, it probably, we're not going to find her. They're like, we don't care. We're still going to, we're still going to do that. We're still going to figure this out. We're still going to keep, you know, fighting for it. And it was, it was, to, that part was amazing. I think that's the part where you're, we're talking about is the, like the tearjerker part of it, because I can't even imagine what that would feel like you know, for somebody to have to go through that and not even just go through the loss because we know that happens missing people or, 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 or that kind of thing in it. But usually the, you know, police or or community, they rally around you and they, everybody's trying to help or whatever. But when you are stonewalled in that, Mm -hmm. in, in that, in that, you know, feeling that you have already in that pit of your stomach, like, oh my God, you know, I can't even imagine like you just want to curl up into a ball and just, you know, like I, I can't handle this, you know? So that to me, I mean, what did you guys take from that the whole part about the the family and kind of the, the the measures they took to keep pushing to get answers? Was that something that that resonated with you at all, or um, you know, because to me it was, I thought, yeah, you know, I I might because I'm kind of a big mouth when I want I have to be, but that was above and beyond because these people, like we said, are are you know small town community, um, you know, English is their second language. Uh, they, they're not military people, you know, all of that kind of stuff I thought played into that story. Yeah. I think, I think there's two things here, right? The first thing is their use. I think they, they're the first, uh, group to use social media to, um, advance their cause in the military. Um, and I thought, I thought that they're, because they were so close, I would say that they did have home field advantage because they were only three hours away. Now you have to understand when a military person goes missing from a military installation, it is rarely the case that their family is nearby. So for example, if you're stationed in Hawaii and you go missing and your family is living in New York, it's very rare. The amount of families that can afford to basically pick up and move to Hawaii. So in this particular particular case we do have the fact that the proximity is so close to where they're where they're from because I believe it was um when she went missing it was it was during the week and then by that weekend or I think it maybe it was by the following weekend the family had like homemade signs like they went to Walmart bought some homemade signs and they picketed so and I, I have not very I have not seen very many cases where they use not only social media but picketing so they're picking picketing out there right and the mom is out there no no media is picking up on this case except for like you know the b team from like the local qr tv or whatever it is and the mom is talking in spanish and you would think and this is what got to me in this particular case you would think that they would bring a translator and i'm talking about the family i not think that they need a translator that the media would bring a translator like you're sticking a mic in someone's face and the mom is talking in spanish and there is no translator (laughs) in fact myra is the one that has to once the mom goes on you know because the mom goes on these rants and and i'm not saying i'm not calling it a rant for purposes of saying that it's not important she goes into long very important rants like claiming that she wants to know where her daughter is and poor myra after the mom has talked for five minutes has to try and recap in english what the mom has said and so that caught me because you got the mom crying and you're just like, and there's like only a few people out there picketing and there's like, you know, where is Vanessa? Where is Vanessa? And then once they get on social media and they get, it starts to get picked up. And then once the mom, you know, puts out the information about the fact that Vanessa hadn't been doing so well and that she had um, had told her mom about some sexual harassment issues. And then they start also intertwining all the other missing people that have, all the other people that have, have gone missing. It's almost like a snowball. It starts very, very slow. But then someone creates the I am Vanessa Guillen um, hashtag. And then from there, it just takes off. And the family's use of social media and basically not backing down because the 
the military will do that where they will put out some information like, hey, we're doing our best. Please don't speculate. In this particular case, thank goodness that people were speculating because it, it, ended, it ended up being the worst case scenario. But a lot of people in the military would have you believe like, oh, she was just so sick of life. Look at her tweets. And she was talking about how life could be so much better. She probably just, you know, packed it up and left to Mexico all on her own. But this particular family knew that that was not the case. They were like, something else is going on here. And with social media and with picketing, they were able to kind of create that snowball effect that they needed to basically become the David in the David and Goliath story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So on April 24th, the um, Find Vanessa Gee and Facebook page is made um, and friends and family are tweeting, sharing, you know, her missing poster after just one week of no answers. Um, like you mentioned, Margo, it was just one week after um, they start to pick it outside of Fort Hood. And then each week, more people started coming. Um, local te television started to pick it up after a month, still nothing. And it wasn't until about six weeks later that the Guillen family hired a military attorney. Because like we're saying, these are just normal people. Uh, I don't even know like half of the military terminology. So I can, I can only imagine, you know, somebody who is an immigrant, they probably, they didn't know the right questions to ask. So hiring the military attorney, I think was the best thing they could have done for that family in the entire investigation. And it wasn't until two months later that the military finally makes a statement. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that really got under Myra and the rest of the family's skin. They're like, now, like mm -hmm. now you want to make a statement. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that's when Myra posts on the fine Van Vanessa Guillen page, and starts to call attention to sexual harassment and assault assault in the military. And uh, one of the things she tweeted was, how can someone go missing on base and a sergeant sexually harassing a soldier? Justice needs to be served. And after that, that's when the hashtag I am Vanessa Guillen, because it not only went from like, oh, we have a missing soldier. It, it sparked the whole sexual harassment on military U.S. soil base. Like mm -hmm. we're saying, oh, it's a safe space. It's they're in uniforms, they're professionals. And it's like, no. And it it was retweeted over, gosh, hundreds of thousands of times. And people really started to speak out and share their own stories and share their own experiences of what they experienced while in the military. Um, murals start to pop up all over the world, not just in the United States. Celebrities are retweeting. They're sharing photos of uh, Vanessa on their social media. And people even start to change their profile photos of Vanessa so, or their profile pictures to a photo of Vanessa. Um, so yeah, it really blew up. Like Margo was saying, the power of social media in this case just took over, um, which, yay. <laughs> and something I'm sure they didn't, ex nobody expected to, to happen Definitely in this not. case. It's one of those rare things that for some reason it strikes a chord, you know, and maybe it was the, when they, she started tweeting about sexual harassment, because if that had been, you know, something that was very prevalent and people are seeing this and that has happened to them or their sister or their mother or their wife, you know, they're, they're going to want to, you know, they, they're like, Hey, somebody's talking about this and they all jump on to, to tell their, their stories. So, um, yeah. Well, and Myra was even hesitant to post it. She was like, what if I get in trouble? Mm -hmm. Like she was scared. Cause she was like, Oh, like, what if, you know, they come after me and the family. And she's like, you know, what? I just decided to post it because they were so mad that after two months now they want to make a statement. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, talk about just the family coming together. Like she, who knows what could have happened. I don't know. Could, can the military come after somebody for doing that? I have no idea, but um, you know, she was like, I got to find my sister. I got to spark some attention. And she took it upon her own hands and, you know, posted that tweet. And then that's where it, really took off so and that's like what you said margo one of the things um that you said they they come up with come out with a statement or something and that's what happened it was two months later where the commander um of of fort hood army base scott Flint, said he stated that the allegations of sexual assault or harassment on base were quote fully investigated he's talking about all of them right they're fully investigated and then he said and the cid stated that there was no credible information that vanessa was sexually harassed or assaulted and they would keep saying that for a while you know, they would keep saying that for a while that, you know, and like we said, did she specifically state that that 
happened except for that one incident you talked about? No, but can you kind of extrapolate that maybe this is happening because she was talking about it and maybe you need to investigate to see if it happened? You know, so, <laughs> but they would just basically say, oh, it's been investigated, you know, and there's no uh, credible information on that. So uh, the attorney was like, well, okay, so basically you're saying she's lying. You know, you're saying she's lying is what you're saying. So, uh, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's it's crazy. And then the other thing we didn't say is that the family um, and the attorney, they started their own, their own search. One of the things that Vanessa's sister was saying is, you guys have the full power of the military, all the resources, and we have to do this mm -hmm. on our own? We have to do this on our own? Mm -hmm. You can't help us? You have no, nothing to help us, you know? So I can just, you could just see see the frustration on, on them that we have to take all of this on herself, you know, to, to mm -hmm. search and to investigate and all of these things, which just seems a little bit crazy, but that's, that's and one of the things that I think um, Myra said on the show, on the, on the documentary was that the military did, was hesitant to even allow EquiSearch to get involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow. Cause you know, sometimes, you know, you don't want people snooping around your business, which is crazy. Cause you're trying to find a missing person. But, um, but yeah, I remember Tim Miller being a big part of this, of this case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's, I didn't even know, I know the, I knew the poly class foundation. I know that they were involved. I know that one is, I didn't know EquiSearch. So I don't know if that was from a different part of the country or whatever. Poly class foundation start, started out here. So that's why I know about it more. Oh, okay. Yeah. EquiSearch is, is basically, is based out of Texas. I believe oh, they go. do go to other places, but they're based out of Texas. Okay. So it's kind of the same thing as the poly class. They, they mm -hmm. do the, the same types of things. Um, but yeah, I guess some places are just more known because of where they started at. As the year closes out and the dawning of a new year is on the horizon, you're probably starting to take stock of those things you planned to handle once and for all in 2022, and yet didn't. Well, if one of those tasks was to get your financial future in order, you're in luck. Fabric by Gerber Life is the easy one-stop shop you need with life insurance and other family finance solutions all in one place. Look, once you've started adulting, and especially after you have kids, your priorities change. One of those priorities is to make sure your kids' futures are secure. But just how to do that can be confusing. Fabric is a company designed by parents for parents to help you get a high-quality, surprisingly affordable life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. Fabric makes it easy for you to apply, see your quote, and then personalize it for your family's needs all online and on your schedule. You could be offered coverage instantly with no health exam required. With over 1,600 five-star reviews on TrustPilot.com, you can feel confident that you're getting a high-quality policy that is perfect for your family. And Fabric offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can cancel at any time. And did I say Fabric is partnered with Gerber Life, a name millions of families know and have trusted for over 50 years? Protect your family today with Fabric by Gerber Life. Apply today in just 10 minutes at meetfabric.com slash once. That's meetfabric.com slash once. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash once. Policies issued by Western Southern Life Assurance Company. Not available in certain states. Prices subject to underwriting and health questions. So th this is kind of where it goes on from here. Um, and then we find it on June 30th, which how long was it? That was I mean, two months. Weeks. 10 weeks, right? April, 20, she went missing on April 22nd. Yeah. That's when fi human remains are finally found uh, among the, the Leon River. And uh, can, can I say something real quick sure. before you go on there? Yeah. Because there was something that the documentary uh, basically just w swept right under the rug. They just kind of like went right over. But a, we um, a few days before they found Vanessa Guillen, they found a different body. And it was the body of uh, another soldier that went missing in August of 2019. Wow. He had been considered AWOL. His name was Gregory, uh, Gregory Morales. And he was a couple of weeks away of getting out of the military. And he went missing. He, and I don't know who reported him missing, but I think it was his mom. He went missing. And for a whole couple months, nine, ten months, his mom was shouting from the rooftops, like, my son is missing. And the military was like, no, he's just AWOL. And so then... Um, 
in the on the tip line they got a tip and it brought them to uh, i believe it was like a park or a neighborhood where they found human remains and initially everyone thought it was Vanessa Guillen but then when they did um the DNA test they found out it was Gregory Morales now mind you he's literally laying in a shallow grave he's been listed as AWOL and his mom has to fight with the military to overturn his AWOL status to basically show that he was murdered because the military was what was basically like, well, he could have gone AWOL and then, you know, something happened to him. And they were like, no, we need to get this autopsy to show that he was murdered close to the date where he went missing to show he wasn't missing. So he could get like the full military honors and all that. Wow. And the weird thing is because he was still married to his wife who has since gotten into some trouble and, his, his case is still unsolved, but his wife ended up getting like all the life insurance and all of that jazz. So that was a case that the, that really it should be a part. Whenever you see me cover the I Am Vanessa Guillen, whenever you see me cover Vanessa's case, I normally do it in conjunction with something having to do with Gregory Morales because the cases, even though they're different, they both started as a missing persons case. And had Vanessa Guillen not gone missing, we would have never found Gregory. Wow. So wow. anyway, so the whole point is that so a few days before this happened, before they found Vanessa, they found the body and they hadn't even told the mom. They haven't they hadn't told the mom yet because they were afraid to tell her. And then it was kind of like a sigh of relief to a certain extent to them when they found out it wasn't Vanessa. But sadly, a few days later, like you said, on June 30th, they would discover Vanessa's remains. Mm, that so so that's another part that is just so much more. Uh, it just adds another dimension to this case. Right. Thank you for sharing that. Cause as we're going through this, I'm thinking to myself, God, yeah, you know, now um Equisearch is in it. And then the army finally did <laughs> after Equisearch uh started their search and investigation, the army finally did start their own on Fort Hood. Sorry. <laughs> I keep wanting to say Fort Bragg, but it's not. Um on Fort Hood space. Um and so I was thinking in my head, God, they didn't find like anything like not even one human remain especially after the 39 that had gone missing you know in 2022 and so I'm just like over here thinking so thank you for sharing that I had no idea yeah yeah so you know they do they do find you know we find that you know she was murdered of course um and their theory was that she was killed by Aaron Robinson like blunt force trauma to the head like we talked about her body was placed in this box this tough box um she had been dismembered this is the theory, um, and that uh, a twenty-year-old uh, girlfriend or fiance or something of of Aaron Robinson named Cecily Aguilar was the one who helped him dispose of her body uh, near the river. Um, the reason they said she was dismembered is she was buried in three separate locations. They found, and at first I thought, well, was that was that just that there was you know animals had dug up, you know what happens and things get scattered, but. Uh, no, it seemed like it was very, they said it was very sophisticated the way that she was buried. They, this is what they called it, sophisticated, I believe, because it was underneath concrete and three separate locations and all this kind of stuff. I don't know that that means that these guys were like, you know, criminal masterminds, but they, they weren't geniuses. No. no, but they went to the extra extent to try to hide her body, basically, I think is what they were saying. Yeah. They went back, they went back to that crime scene. Oh, so, so there was a two crime, this, uh, well, allegedly, we don't really, I will never know. But the first crime scene was where Vanessa was murdered. And the second would be when he took her out to the Leon, it was near the Leon River. Um, when he took her out there, that's when they, they did the dismembering. Mm -hmm. um, but once they did the dismember, I mean, it was, it was, it was very elaborate. They, they tried to dismember her. They tried to burn the body. They went on Facebook to try and get concrete and they got the concrete. They poured it over the, th over the, um, the area. And it was so insane because Tim Miller, they had actually searched the area where they found Vanessa a few days earlier. Mm -hmm. So they had found, or they had searched that area a few days earlier, but what ended up, um, bringing them back was one, um, some construction workers smelled something. And then when they went back and they stopped, you know, cause sometimes you're looking just in front of you and you're looking down in this particular case, what brought their attention was when they looked up, they found that the trees, the leaves on the trees had been burned oh. from when they had tried to burn her bones. Wow. Um, or they had tried to burn her body. And so that's when when they saw the concrete and they saw the three different holes. Because I don't believe they were very far from each other. The three separate locations um, was when they they went in and found her. But I mean, yeah, it wasn't it was elaborate. It took you know, it took them a long time um, 
to do this. I mean, I, I would have never, I always thought it was weird. I was like, you, so you go to Facebook to try and find concrete. Um, but apparently, you know, Facebook marketplace has a, you oh, know, has geez. something for everyone. <laughs> no, I thought it was so, you know, wow. I thought it was so strange. Um, that is strange. But yeah, no, it was. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so of course now uh, they figure out, I guess because the investigation had been ongoing and I, I would assume he was a person of interest um, and he was under watch or something because of, he, they said something about him breaking COVID, COVID protocols history. or some some minor thing like that, which is weird. Do you think that's true or do you think they were watching him for some other reason? You know, it's odd. You know, I'm not exactly sure um, what I'm not sure what I think, to be honest. Um, I do believe they were watching him. Um, and in, even in the documentary, they said, like, we for, we failed or they failed to tell the person who was watching him that he was he was uh, suspected in the in the disappearance of Vanessa Guillen. But I don't think they would have told that person anyway, whether whether they knew what he was going to do or, or not. I don't right. think they would have told him. Um, so I, I don't necessarily really know what. I don't know why he was, I'm assuming he was under supervision because they had the information about Cecily Aguilar because what led them here, I believe, was a lot of the cell phone records and that they had been kind of accumulating throughout the, the days before uh, before they found Vanessa. Mm. So clearly, if they had these cell phone records, they would have suspected Cecily and, and Robinson at the same time. But at one point, she lied, which is some of the charges that she just pled guilty to just a couple days ago. But she lied to the police, and I guess the cell phone records showed them something else, which is how they found their body is the, the pings on the phone or whatever um, brought them to where they found her body. Um, but ultimately, what they failed to do was when Cecily, they must have left her, let her have her phone or something Something happened, but when Cecily made the admission about what happened, uh, the media, because the media was all over this case, they picked up on it. And then allegedly Robinson was looking at his phone. And when he saw the post that said they found remains mm -hmm. near the Leon River, which they suspect to be Vanessa, that's when he allegedly decided he was going to go. And then he basically took his own life. Right. Yeah, because he he just fled at that point because he knew like the writing was on the wall like this was this was this was over and done with pretty much. Um, so then yeah, so the only case now would be against uh, Cecily, which has been gotten on ongoing. Like you said, she just pled guilty, so you know I'm sure you'll probably do uh, you did a follow up on that recently, I believe, on military murder. I did a TikTok. I no, oh, I did TikTok. a TikTok okay. on her pleading guilty, but she hasn't been sentenced yet. Okay, so that that's mm -hmm. we're still waiting to see what happens there. But yeah, so this is the one thing I got to say when they talk about the motive and I'm like, what the hell? It doesn't make any sense to me. I know. You know, it says the report was released on May 24th stated that he explained that he killed Vanessa, that, exp that explained why Robinson killed Vanessa because Vanessa saw Robinson's cell phone lock screen, which happened to be a photo of Cecily. Worried that Vanessa would say something and worried he'd get in trouble for violating the Army's fraternization rules since Cecily was still married to another soldier. He then grabbed the hammer and started hitting Vanessa in the head. That sounds so weak to me. So friggin' weak to me. Give me yeah. a break. Especially if he was already <laughs> on being held for breaking COVID protocols, you can tell he was probably like, whatever, I'm going to do what I want. You think he cares that he's That's just weak. seen another soldier's you know, estranged wife, like, no. And why would um, he Vanessa my... say anything? Who, who does she give a crap about him? You know what I mean? Like, exactly. You, you do you, man. Uh, yeah. Like I mentioned earlier, my theory is, you know, I do think he was, you know, making sexual harassment statements towards her. And I think he tried to push himself onto her and she, you know, was going to do something about it finally. And you know, again, it probably cost, it did cost her life. Um, yeah. That's just what I think happened. I don't think that, and even if she did see the photo, I'm thinking maybe she was, I know I am such a ball buster. A lot of Latina women are like, oh, who's that girl on your phone? You know, like, oh, isn't she married? You know, maybe that's like kind of where I first went. Like maybe she was just busting his balls and then, you know, he took it very personally. And then, but then I was like, no, 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 no. Like, that something happened. Mm -hmm. I will say, I will say this. Um, it does seem incredulous to believe that that would be the only motive for someone to kill. However, having covered so many of these military cases, um, there are a lot of cases, uh, not just this one, but there are cases where just the threat 
of reporting someone for something as insignificant as adult adultery is again is illegal it is um against the UCMJ it, you can actually get punished for it it really is it rarely do people get punished for it um however everyone seems to absolutely freak out when they are um, confronted with the possibility that people will know about their indiscretions and so I while it, it it is hard to believe that that is the case, there are so many other cases that are very similar to this. Um, in this particular case, what is so strange is that it doesn't appear to me that Robinson and Vanessa really knew each other outside mm -hmm. of work. So, and that's one of the things that I wish could be explored more or that people who, who are in Vanessa's circles at, at work, they would speak on more because I'm like, okay, so how often did they interact with each other? Because there are people who, when I was in the military, I would interact with them like maybe once a month, um, maybe once every few months. Like, I want to know more about that relationship, but it almost seems like it's so secretive that no one's talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, because like you said, if they were, maybe they hung out a couple of times and then she did like, you know, like you just said, like maybe was like a ball buster, like, oh, who's that girl? Isn't she married? I'm going to write you out. I could see um, him being more like offended, but if he didn't really know her, he would be like, who the hell is she? Is she really going to write me out? Like, so that whole, whole um, dynamic is, is something that we, we're not privy to, but I do agree that it, it is just outrageous. Um, but I just covered, I did a TikTok on a guy who murdered this other guy who as part of an investigation, he went in and told the truth. The guy was already out of the military, so he had already been kicked out. So it was no point, but he came back for revenge to kill the guy. Hmm. I mean, it, made, wow. it was just so weird. I was like, it's not like you're getting back into the military. So what's the well, why would you even yeah. kill someone? But some, some people just do it for revenge. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You know, it could be anything. It's just like, it, it seems like there would be so many other things going on there. But, you know, who knows? It could be, and like you said, we will never know this. Um, you know, and basically just, just, we'll just say this really quickly because everybody can watch the documentary. I think it's, it's really worth watching. Uh, it's only one, you know, some of them are series. This is just uh, one, uh, one episode is about an hour and a half long. Um, and they show the family going into, you know, trying to get this act passed, um, the I Am Vanessa Guillen Act. So, and this would shift prosecutorial decision for sexual harassment um, allegations to be investigated investigated outside of the chain of command um and investigated in you know that so basically more eyes on it not just the military slapping a thing saying okay yeah we, we we investigate it we're done with this um more consequences against uh you know sex, people in the military uh, accused of sexual harassment and assault that kind of thing so um but yeah the, this been a bill that been trying to get passed since 2010 um and uh they decided them and their attorney decided to to use uh, Vanessa's case as maybe a catalyst to get it finally passed. So, you know, they went to the to White House and they went, you know, to to Congress and they did all of these things. And, and you see this. But what I got to say is that, again, showing the strength of the family, the sisters, the, the mother was not doing well during this time. You know, mm -hmm. obviously, after she lost her daughter, she she had some health issues. And, and you know, of course, you know, she was just broken at that point and and they were really worried about her. Um, but the sisters continued on. And, and I was very, I have to say, I just was very impressed with the 16 year old sister Lupe because yes. she's just an amazing girl. And, you know, and then the, when she talks about how she's out there, she's the one with the, with the bullhorn, you know, out there. <laughs> yep. like, what do we want? Justice, like, you know, all of this, right. You know, just everybody, oh, let's pass the bullhorn around. Everybody <laughs> can talk about, you know, but that was because she couldn't go inside into the, the, you know, to the court thing the hearing or her mom didn't want her in there but she just keeps on talking and talking into the and you know she breaks down but she keeps going you know um very very strong you know very much wanting to get justice for her sister and uh and then they said that she did not speak until she was seven she couldn't speak mm -hmm. you know not that she couldn't speak english no she couldn't speak so, uh, because, and it's like, oh my God, that is amazing. And then at the end, my, they say Myra said that she's going to go into, wanted to go into, uh, um, uh, politics or, or yeah. And I thought, man, I was thinking Lupe was, she's going to be a, a friggin' you know, Congresswoman for sure, if not a Senator <laughs> or, you know, an attorney something. Cause that woman, she's got a very, and she's only 16 when this happened yeah. to be that strong at yeah. that age, you know, and be that outspoken, uh, man, that that girl, she could do anything. I think so. I was just very impressed with with uh, the way they showed how the family was so so involved and s s moved this forward. Um, and and I just love that. And I wanted to talk to you guys about that because was there anything 
in that you saw in this, you know, Margo researching the case or, or watching the documentary or whatever that you related to the most? And, and because I know, Margo, you have daughters, you know, you have daughters, your mom, you know, which I was shocked when I found out you had three children. <laughs> Like, I'm like, she's I'm not old like, enough what? to have one. Like, <laughs> she has Do three. I have three. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. You're deceptively uh, uh, youngish, which, you know, God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think for me, um, what, what gave me inspiration or what I really, um, I mean, I, I, I watched the case. I followed the case from the beginning, but there was this one thing where, uh, that one time when the mom, they're like in front of that gate that says the, 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 the great place and the mom, they bring the mom in and she looks like she's about to die. She is literally so fragile. They like have to hold her up. Right. And then she gets up. Right. And she stands up and, and she's kind of, she's kind of scratching. Right. She's not tall because she's, you know, in so much pain, but then you can see like in her. Right. And she like lifts her body up and she starts talking and she's like, I just want my daughter. And then she really, and then she basically is like, come hell or high water, I will shut this base down if you guys don't return my daughter to me the same exact way that I gave her to you. And she just goes off. I mean, and she is like a freaking lion. And that part for me was really inspirational, right? A, a lot of true crime inspiration for me comes in knowing that there's people who can overcome the murder of a child, the brutal murder mm -hmm. of a child. You know, the, the saddest part about this murder is that, like she said, she was never able to see her baby's face one last time because these cowards destroyed her. Like there was no open casket funeral. She didn't get that opportunity to get that closure. But these cases can give inspiration to so many people um, who are maybe not going through a death necessarily, but sometimes there's things that just knock you on your feet, right? It could be, you know, a divorce. It could be losing a job. It could be a lot of different things. But when you see someone like this take so much inspiration in a moment where they're really never going to see that loved one anymore, it's almost just like very encouraging for everyone. And, and I, and, and, so I say I hate true crime because I do. There's so many times where I'm researching a case or I'm watching a documentary and I'm literally just bawling my eyes out. And I'm like, I'm never watching anything like this again. I don't ever want to tell another true crime story. But I realize that you can get so much inspiration or you can give so much hope and inspiration through tragic stories like this. And there's so many other parents who are experiencing the same thing as Vanessa Guillen's family is right now. And when they see that this family was able and willing to fight, they might be able to gain that inspiration. So for me, I think the turning point in this particular case, in Vanessa's case, was that speech. When the mom gave that speech, I mean, I remember I was working because I was working from home because it's COVID. So I'm working from home. I'm watching the, I'm, I'm watching her talk and I am literally bawling my eyes out while I'm trying to like write emails for work and stuff. And it was just, I mean, it was just so inspirational that particular time. So I think that I, I got, and 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 like you said, you didn't think I had three kids. When I, when I saw that she, the mom had six kids, you know, and she is, uh, you know, she could have very well fallen apart for the whole family, um, but she gained inspiration and she's like, okay, well, my one kid was taken, but we're going to keep fighting for her because we need to show the world. You know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think that you, you, when you said that about the mom, how strong she was, and obviously that rubbed off on her daughters, obviously, you know, like you, you can do, you can do anything, you know what, quit whining and get your ass, you know, get your ass up and, and face the day. Like that's, that's kind of the family I came from too. Like, just do it. Don't, you know, you don't, you don't whine about it. You don't complain about it. You just get up and do it. Cause you know, my, my parents, well, my dad, especially came from uh, you know, they were this family with farm workers, you know, migrant farm workers for a long time before they finally could get settled. And so, you know, they went through a tough, 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 tough times, you know, and, and, you know, he tells the stories now like they're funny, you know, like, oh, yeah, we didn't have nothing to eat, and, you know, like my feet were always wet and I never did that uh, and, and, and laugh. You know, I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, <laughs> but that's why now, you know, but we learned that and it's like, oh, don't complain about nothing, man, because <laughs> it could have been so much worse. And thank God Definitely. that our parents, you know, said, no, we're going to do, you know, we're going to get settled and do better and get, you know, these kind of jobs and, and raise our kids a different way. And so, you know, we may not have had a lot, but man, it was a mansion compared to what, you know, where my dad grew up. So yeah, you take that mm -hmm. strength. I think you see this from the daughters you take that, he, they took that strength from the mom, everything that she went through. She was, I heard something about her immigration status was under question.
question or something was going on at that time during when this was happening. Um, she was dealing with that as well, that, that she had was on some kind of probation or thing or something because her immigration oh status. Um, at the same oh, time, her daughter that. was missing. So uh, just, wow. yeah, crazy. And then they finally, like, gave her some kind of thing because, you know, all this was going on. I don't know. Maybe that, that helped influence it or whatever to basically just say, okay, we're cool, uh, whatever it is, um, which is so crazy. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Me, I, uh, I mean, I'm not a mom. I don't have daughters, um, but I have nieces. and um, But you are a daughter. Family. <laughs> you have a mom. I am a daughter. Exactly. I have a mom. Um, but for me, yeah, just uh, in the beginning of the documentary, they say, you know, the um, – Hispanic Mexican community is a sleeping giant and yes. you know this case woke it up and for me yeah just seeing that the Mexican flag flying and the Mexican flag meshed with the American flag that was so powerful for me because you know coming from a family of traditional Hispanics it is I, I mean Esther you weren't even allowed to learn the language because it's like no you know don't be proud of who you are thankfully for me my parents were very open like you know be proud of that you are Hispanic but a lot of people don't have that so seeing that it was just so powerful to have this whole culture it, it, it was it was the culture that came out and they were loud they were proud and they wanted justice and that was like what really got me I was like oh, that's just so beautiful imagine if we all came together all the time you know what now <laughs> could move mountains the whole Latin community could move and you know conquer so much if we just you know kept the momentum go com, kept this momentum going um, and yeah. not just for this case, but so many other things that are going on right now in this country. So that's what got to me. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think it, it really was, you know, and it, it started with the family. It was the power of that family, the love that they had for each other. It was really, it drove them so, so much, you know, to, to first of all, find Vanessa, you know, and then when they found out that, that, you know, the unfortunate outcome of it, to, to fight for her name and for justice for her. So um, I think that that's, that's where it always starts. It always starts within you, within your, you know, your family, your loved ones. Um, and then being able to relate to that, being able to relate mm -hmm. to this, like, oh my God, if I ever lost my daughter or something like that, and then wanting to do something because you feel like, I can't even imagine going through this, but you know, if any way I can support them or whatever, or yes, my daughter was sexually harassed in the military or something like that. And I want to fight for this too. So it starts there, but I got to say this, you know, just in closing out, it was really driven by the women, really driven by the women, Yes, you know, and that <laughs> tends to happen, especially in, in Latino communities, at least what I've seen, <laughs> that tends yeah. to happen because yeah. we ain't like, oh, you'd mess with my kid. Uh-uh. Uh uh. <laughs> and now you now you like you said you know you, you woke the beast. So and we, you know we we know this is like you know it, whether you have a mom or you are a mom you're like mm -mm, don't mess with my kid man don't even don't, don't yeah. even look sideways <laughs> at my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good. No, that's a really good point. That it, it was the all the whole entire thing was led by women. You're mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Yep. And so that was I. Th I like that a lot. And then even the attorney. The attorney was a female, yep. and she was pretty fierce. I liked her. I liked her. Oh I thought, yeah. Yeah. She was pretty. She was pretty good. And she was also a daughter of immigrants. You know, different community, but mm -hmm. also a daughter of immigrants. And they became family. I thought that was so cool that they became like a family with this woman who really was like, and she did the work pro bono. She was like, she, mm -hmm. I was like, really? God, cause that was, I don't know how, <laughs> I guess maybe she had, you know, money coming in somewhere else because that was a lot of time, a lot of time and stuff. And then, you know, I'm, I am sure there would probably was like, um, you know, things that were, were going on and they were getting donations and things like that. But man, it, yeah, it was just, it was a really, so yeah, I would, I would say, would, would you guys recommend people watch, watch this document? Of course, like you said, there's, there are big holes in the story, but you could just listen to Military Murder <laughs> to find out the rest of it. I'll fill in the gaps for you. Fill in the gaps. Yeah, I, I would highly recommend the, the documentary. I think for someone who, if you don't know the story, if you do know the story, I think it's, it was, it's a great way, it's a great tribute from the family. And I think that the family, of course, was the one that led the documentary right um but it was so nice to kind of put all the pieces together from start to finish which is what i've been trying to do throughout my podcast because i started with i believe it was episode 31 when vanessa was still missing and then i did another episode like 37 when they found her and i did another episode actually when the fort hood uh, independent review came out because it revealed so many holes in the investigation um so i've covered I, i've covered those parts of it and it was just interesting to watch the documentary because it almost is exactly as 
I envisioned it, it would be, you know what I mean? Except there are certain holes, but I don't, you know, I think that, like you said, um, Esther, there's always going to be, um, you know, they're not going to want to talk about the murder because it's not about necessarily the murder. It's about the case and what led up to the changes in the law and that type of stuff. Um, but of course, for anyone who wants to know, because I'm nosy and I would want to know like, oh my gosh, what caused such outrage, right? Because there has to be something that caused such an outrage. Um, but I, I think the documentary is a good watch. Uh, I really loved hearing from the family. I loved hearing the aspect of the attorney um, because really the, the case did turn around when the attorney came came forward. I think she had a lot of connections uh, with media sources, which is why this case got so much uh, additional traction. Um, but I loved I love to hear her backstory. Right. Um, a part of me is, is always uh, when I watched the documentary, I was like, man, I was like, I shouldn't have had so many kids. That could be me <laughs> <laughs> going out there, you know, because that's really what I envisioned of my so life when I kids. became a lawyer. Uh, and I was like, oh, but, you know, I chose I chose family life. But, you know, those are decisions that, you you know, you make. But. I was very inspired and I think it's a, a very well done documentary. Yeah. So, so of course you can, you can find military murder on every podcast app, but also you, you reminded me your TikTok. You say you have TikTok. So yeah, if you want to follow Margot on TikTok, cause she does uh, these little snippets of these other cases, right? Sep totally separate cases. And those are always interesting because, but does it make you, when you get those, does it make you want to like research it more? Because it does me. Oh, <laughs> Girl, listen. Okay, so I was just about to say, so if people want to follow me, you could follow my TikTok, but follow my YouTube because I do intend on doing more more long format because like you said, Esther, like three minutes is not enough when you're like a true, like hardcore, you want to know every single detail. You want to know like what the person ate for breakfast. Like you want to know everything. That's me. <laughs> um, and so like, when people recommend a case to me, I'll be I'll be researching it, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna make this 200 words or less, and, and you know, uh, two thousand you know, hours later, later it's thousand <laughs> words, and I'm like, how am I gonna make this into a three minute video? Which is why I started YouTube now. I have one question for you, Margot. As a mom, as a veteran, would you let your daughters enlist into the military? <laughs> oh, that's a funny question. No, the answer is well. I, I, I guess I can't control what they do, yeah. right? Would you? Uh, but it? but I, I, I wouldn't encourage it necessarily. I don't. I, I'm, and 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 uh, their father and I talk about this all the time. Um, but I, I wouldn't encourage it only because of everything that's come to light now. Um, and having served, like I said, I, I was also a sexual assault, um, a victims counsel when I served, and it was just a very heartbreaking thing to see, you know, when you go out, but it's the same thing for colleges. You know, sometimes I feel bad even saying that because the same thing that happens in the military can happen in, in colleges. It can happen anywhere. It can happen in your hometown. Um, but the thing about the military is that once you're in, you can't just be like, all right, I've decided I don't want to be here anymore and leave. And I want my daughters to have the opportunity to come home whenever they want to. They are always welcome in with open arms. They can stay forever if they want. Mm -hmm. um, and so if, you know, letting them join the military, I think would just be, um, it's just, it's just difficult, but I know everyone has their own opinions. I joined, I, I joined the military like strictly for college. I did the ROTC thing and they paid for my college and it was a great experience for myself. Um, but, you know, I'm trying to build a different lifestyle for my daughters and I want them to have, like, I want to be able to, like, if I could put my kids through college straight up with them, ha without them having to get into debt. Um, that's my number one goal. And then they can go out and do what they want to do. And if they decide to to do that in the military, then that's, then that's their choice. Um, but that was also one of the main reasons why I ended up getting out. Um, I ended up getting off of active duty. I'm a reservist now. Um, but I got off of active duty because I was putting my uniform on every day and my daughters were seeing that and they were like, you're so brave. You're so this. And I mean, yes, I can still be all those things. Um, but you know, I, I wanted to kind of separate myself a little bit from that because I wanted to, I wanted them to be, I didn't want them to be like, this is the only life I, lifestyle I know. You know what I mean? Yeah. That was a great question. Yeah. Thanks, Lorena. Um, for yeah. that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. It was so much fun. Oh my gosh. I learned so much more about this case. Of course, I knew that was going to happen. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to get, and of course you guys want to hear the whole thing and so many other cases, uh, definitely subscribe to Military Murder. Um, it's an amazing podcast. She does a great job. You, you hear her voice. It's wonderful. So I love listening exactly. to her voice. <laughs> I've been smiling this whole time because yeah. you're just like, you have that sass. You have you, you have like a little bit of that uh, like Latina accent, which I wish I had. I'm like such a good guy. And I'm like, <laughs> um, so no, I love just chatting with you and listening to your voice. Yeah, it's, just, yeah, it's, a, it's a great listen, you guys. So check it out. And yeah, I'll be seeing, I'm sure I'll be seeing you around podcast land for sure. And, uh, and yeah. thanks so much for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. 
Thanks for listening, and a very, very big thanks to my guest, Margot from Military Murder. She gave us a much more in-depth look at this case and how military justice is unique from what we know as our civilian justice system. If you want to hear her series on the Vanessa Guillen case or any of her other episodes of Military Murder, you can listen wherever you get your podcasts or go to her website, militarymurderpodcast.com. And don't forget to subscribe. Also, a very special thank you to Lorena for co-hosting with me today, as well as for the audio mix in this episode and everything else she does to keep OUAC running. Thanks, Lorena. At the end of this episode, there is a short clip from the documentary I Am Vanessa Guillen, now streaming on Netflix. We thank Netflix for providing this clip for our listeners. Wishing you all the happiest of holiday seasons and a fabulous new year. Once Upon a Crime will be off for the holidays and back with our first episode of the new year on January 16th. If you miss me while I'm away, you can always follow me on social media to see what I'm up to. Go to our website, truecrimepodcast.com, to grab all the links to our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube channels. You can also catch me on a couple of other podcasts I recently guest hosted on, including Crawl Space and True Crime Binge. You can watch the video of my Crawl Space appearance on their YouTube channel as well. All the links to those episodes are in the show notes. There will be one more bonus episode on Patreon this year. This is a much anticipated episode because it is co-hosted by my little sister, Yolanda. She is my most requested guest, and you'll get to hear us talk about a case she covered when it first broke, and all the latest developments, the Sherry Papini disappearance hoax. Listen to that on Patreon by becoming a member at patreon.com slash once upon a crime. Thanks for your support. Once again, thanks for listening. And until next time, be good to one another. grabbing headlines across the nation. People want to know, where is Vanessa Guillen? Where's my sister? They know where she is, and I want them to speak up. This was not one of those cases the military can sweep under the rug. Vanessa's always been the bravest of all of us. Something was wrong with her the few months after she was stationed at Fort Hood. Not being able to sleep, losing weight. She would tell me that things weren't what they seemed. Dijo si he sido acusada por un superior. I called the staff sergeant. He's like, we don't know anything about her. You guys don't have cameras, nothing. And they were like, no. The military did not give a damn. Fort Hood seems to cultivate the worst of the worst. A lot of missing soldiers, a lot of dead soldiers, a lot of bad there. She's in the army. She's supposed to be safe there. Ya traté yo y nada le dije, ¿cómo? Estos animales, dije, no me van a buscar a mi niño. Yo tengo que buscar a mi hija yo. The Guillen family were not going to stay quiet. The Hispanic culture is the sleeping giant. And the Guillen family woke it up. People using my sister as a resemblance of themselves. Hashtag, I am Vanessa Guillen. I remember saying, she is us. It kept going, going. What's your name? Sexual assault scandals are the new norm for the military. Clearly an epidemic. We had no other choice but to go and fight for a legislation under my sister's name. The military counts on survivors and their families staying quiet, and they miscalculated dramatically. If we got Congress to listen, then we can get Congress to pass the bill. This is our last chance. They do not support the full Vanessa Guillen Act. We have to really push on them. This is not a Republican, Democratic issue. This is not a race issue. This is a human issue, so it should be everyone's issue.